what happened to Vicky was, and I got this from her sister who witnessed it, at the United Church Edmonton Residential School, April 10th, 1958, she was uh, coming in from recess too slow. So a matron, um, a, a supervisor called Ann Kaniski picked up a two by four and hit her over the head with it. And she fell down, knocked out, they finally revived her. But that night she died in her sleep. And uh, official cause of death, tuberculosis, which was so common. But um, her sister described, and we have this on film, when Vicky, they brought her little body home in a coffin, the head fell back, skull cap opened up, there was no brain. Because of course you gotta remove any evidence that there was a, a blow, right? And to me, Vicky is symptomatic of what went on in this country, which still goes on, um, and yet glossed over. At the time this Mountie threatened me, uh, Peter Montague, he's head of E Division, uh, secret ops, they call it, black ops, whatever. Um, he actually, these guys are funny, you know, because they think they're God and they can't be touched, so they like to boast to you about what they're going to do to you and what they can do and everything. So Montague said to me that um, you're never, you're not only never going to work in this country again, but nobody's ever going to know, no one's going to remember your name after 10 years. And it's interesting he said that because sure enough, when up to July 8th, 2008, I was quoted in the Globe and Mail, I was on the, because I was the only, the, the, what we were doing, we were the only people talking about it. Even the native people didn't want to talk about mass graves. You could talk about physical and sexual abuse. Right, and the language is very important because it's all designed to soften the impact. They don't talk about murder, rape, torture. They talk about abuse and being estranged from their families and you know all the soft language. Um, but after July 8, 2008, that's when the apology happened. The official apology, you might have remembered Stephen Harper stood up in parliament and didn't apologize for genocide, but uh, other things like taking children from their families and that. Uh, after that date, my name was swabbed out of the media. You never see it again. I was like in apartheid South Africa, they were, when you're banned, your name could never be mentioned in the media. It's why the South Africans came to Canada to set up their apartheid laws. They just studied what we did on the Indian reservations and with the Indian Act and modeled the apartheid laws on, on Canada. Um, and so the same thing happened here. I was banned, being a banned person. And, this generation, when you mention my name, they say, no, I, who's Kevin Annett, right? Like it's, it's very effective now, especially with the internet, to be able to either castigate and smear somebody or just bury their memory. And that's why these events are so important because it's keeping alive, not even the memory of me, but what we brought out, what we forced, the change we forced. Because if you don't remember these things, they happen, they'll happen again, again and again and again, right? In here, I describe an incident that happened about a year after I was fired. The two top officers in the United Church, right on the verge of these lawsuits beginning, the first lawsuit that I mentioned, Virginia Coleman and um, Marion Best, two top officials in the United Church, met with all of the top leaders of what's called the New Chalmers Tribal Council. And I know this from my friend Bruce Gunn, who was a minister. He was one of the United Church minister, the only one who stood by me. And then he got the hammer as well for doing so, but um, he lost his job and marriage, same pattern, right? But um, he said that uh, he was in on this meeting and um, they made an offer to the chiefs, the United Church. And they said, we will provide limited compensation for personal injury lawsuits, personal injury lawsuits, not of a criminal nature because there's civil law and criminal law. And the term abuse refers to what's called a tort offense. So if somebody takes a rock and throws it through your window, you can have a settlement, you can have compensation in that. And that's how the residential school mass murder was defined as a civil action that can be compensated for, not as a criminal act where people are being killed. And so they made the deal that night. They said, we will give you money for personal injury lawsuits, provided you do two things, have nothing to do with Kevin Annett and never acknowledge his existence and never support any inquiry into the death or disappearance of children. And they agreed. All the NTC chiefs agreed. And um, since then, every single chief who had any money from the government pulled back 
they, they not only wouldn't support what we were doing, but they actively campaigned against it. Uh, when we held our first tribunal, we invited a United Nations group called IRAM into Vancouver, June 12th to 14th, 1998. Um, they heard three days of testimonies from why witnesses we had lined up. These are all native people. I was one of the few white people there. We had about 100 people in the Maritime Labor Center in east side of Vancouver. They described things like sterilization programs, medical experiments at Indian hospitals, um, killings. Uh, one woman describes uh, soldiers taking kids out of the hospital and they lining them up against just shooting them and throwing them in a the ditch in 1944. Uh, so these kinds of killings going on, being described for the first time publicly, and um, this, none of that made the media, of course, but um, out of the IRAM tribunal, within six months, the government had set up what's called the Aboriginal Healing Fund, right? the first of their cover-up attempts. What the Healing Fund said, it said, if you're a survivor of residential school, you can get money, provided you do two things. You sign off all legal action, and so you can never sue it and you you indemnify the churches so in other words what you're saying is in return for the money is you didn't do anything wrong in return for this blood money they would do that right a lot of native people wouldn't do it uh, some did but the ones who did are the ones you heard about because they were it's like the natives you see on television the government fund chiefs there was a, a line drawn in the sand and the only people who supported me after that were the people living on the street, the people in reserve. Some of the clan mothers, like especially out here where the clan mother system is more intact, uh, like among the Mohawks, the Grand River Mohawks who invited me in 2011 to come and dig at the mass grave there. Those are the people who we worked with, but it's like you get that division, really it's a class division on every reserve where there's the poor traditional people and then the well-funded government affiliated chiefs and they know you see, not only are they doing it for money, but when they were, you were in residential school, there were, and a lot of survivors described this, Harriet said on the first day, she was at the Alberni Residential School, there lined up 300 of them, all had their heads shaved, they're standing in the rain, they came by head shaved, and there were some native kids with short hair standing on the side holding a little clubs, like something out of Auschwitz, you know, the Zoller Commando, the Jewish... Um, trustees who would line up and beat other Jews into cattle cars and that same system, collaborators. And Harriet turned and talked to her cousin in her language and one of these native kids came over and whacked her and said, you can't speak your language. Now, a lot of those kids, they were in what's called a protected group. So they got education, they weren't raped as often, um, they got better food, they knew how to collaborate. And guess who gets the education? Guess who goes on to become tribal council chief and who is now dealing the drugs on the reserve and trafficking the children? And in, the RCMP look the other way because they're playing the government's game. They sign away the land. You know, they, they're working for, against their own people constantly. And uh, it started early on. It's any system of neocolonialism. The, the British did it in India. They bring leaders over and train them in Oxford and Cambridge, go back and monitor the empire for them. I mean, it, it's, it's how empire works. So why would Canada be any different? What's different about the Canada is so effectively hidden because the country is so vast. I remember asking a reporter, if you're a serial killer, would you get to appoint your own judge and jury? Because that's what's happened with the TRC. The, the church has got to nominate who the TRC commissioners were, the Privy Council Office approved it. These are the very people that did the crime doing the investigation into themselves. And in the mandate, it said, um, you are not allowed to take down as evidence any reference to the death of a child. I mean, what kind of report are you gonna get about residential schools if you can't talk about dead children? You know, it, so the thing is it's been so engineered, whether here or in Ireland, from the very beginning, it's a, a miracle if anyone ever learns something that actually happened in one of these places. It's been like this constant battle to keep the head above water about this whole story. Um, a big development in that was um, I was invited, and then I'll open this up again. I was invited in the spring of 2011 by 10 Mohawk elders in Brantford 
to come and search for the remains of their family members. It was, it's the oldest residential school in Canada, the Mohawk School, set up by the Anglican Church in 1832. Um, and so I sat down like I always did and listened to the people's stories of the survivors, and a lot of them began telling the same stories of children being buried at night. We went out um, ground penetrating radar. We got two archaeologists to come with us. And sure enough, we found these at the very site where people said they'd buried fellow students. We found this a lot of dislocated soil. So we dug within an hour. And this was an accredited dig. I mean, there were archaeologists present. The mo Bill and Cheryl Squire, two of the elders, were the first to open the ground. So it couldn't be said that this white guy came in and started digging, which is what APTN, how they portrayed it later in the smear that happened. Um, but um, the, uh, we found these bones. And Geronimo Henry, one of the survivors, said that whenever they, a child died, they would bury, bury them and then plant a tree on top to cover the remains. Well, sure enough, at the base of one of these old trees, small little tree, in the roots were these white buttons. And they weren't plastic, which means they're pre-World War II. And they were um, bone, made out of bone and um, wood. And um, al they look, it looked like alab alab abalone or something like that, some other substance besides plastic. But um, a couple of these bones we had shipped off to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. And a, a pathologist called Don Ortner, he's one of the world, was one of the world's leading expert on detecting disease in bones, which is important because so many of the, these kids died of TB. That's an important skill. He looked at this bone. He, I remember talking to him on the phone. He said, 95% certain that's a young girl, socket bone. And uh, I'd like to come up. This is January 2012. He was dead in March. He died at 71 of a heart attack. Go figure. But uh, after that, um, the, 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 uh, they're called the Six Nations Confederacy. They're the government-funded chiefs. Bill Montour got called to Ottawa, and he was told to shut down this thing. So right away, the elders start dropping away. Rumor, this typical kind of thing, the rumor mill starts. Uh, they shut, the whole thing is shut down. And uh, subsequently, the Canadian media do report it. They never reported the actual discovery. They just reported the attacks on me. That's the only thing APTN ever said about the dig, is that this guy came in and started digging, and all the Mohawk elders are upset with him. That was it. But that's the only media evidence there is of what happened. What does this have to do with the federal election? <laughs> well. It all started on June 4th when, well, sort of long before that, but suddenly Justin Trudeau, in response to the missing and murdered uh, women's inquiry, which I'm going to talk about because it's very revealing, um, he makes a, makes a statement under pressure, yes, it was genocide. Now, under international law, when genocide is acknowledged or admitted or proven, the UN Convention on Genocide, to which Canada is a signatory, it's, you're obligated to, the word is prosecute and punish. You don't do any more inquiries. You prosecute and punish the nation responsible. Well, what that means is that the citizens of that nation have an obligation under international law not to be accessories to that crime anymore. It means that, that you have the legal right not to fund that government while it's still doing those crimes, not to engage in any, anything that could be construed that you're helping their cover up, which is as serious a crime as the original genocide itself. And um, the, the present government, like the previous government, has in, been involved in suppressing evidence, destroying mass grave sites, uh, presenting the TRC as some kind of genuine inquiry when it was a concerted, uh, systematic destruction of, of the real story, silencing of witnesses, the whole bit. That's all considered genocide in international law. When you're covering up the crime, it's as bad as that. One of the reasons I'm doing this now and running 
and I want to say what I mean by when I'm running because it's not actually running. Um, it's because this needs a new platform all the time, like it constantly, constant efforts to get this out. And Trudeau has just admitted to genocide. So naturally, that has to be an election issue. But under international law, the Crown has lost its jurisdiction. It never had jurisdiction in the first place, but it's a convicted criminal body under the indictment and the, and the conviction in, in Brussels in 2012. Elizabeth Windsor was one of the, I, like, I call them the dirty 30, the 30 defendants who are named, including Joseph Ratzinger and others. Um, Canada needs a new political authority because the existing one doesn't have, even under international law, it doesn't have the right to govern. And we know that for a fact, like 58% of Canadians four years ago in a poll said they wanted a republic. They want all ties with the crown ended. It's an anachronism. We need our own self-governing republic. So in 2015 in Winnipeg, a couple of hundred people got together and formed this movement uh, to form a republic, to act on the majority mandate. And this year they asked me to run as a candidate. There's actually a guy in East York uh, just volunteered today to be another candidate. We now have five. Now, we don't recognize the crown system of, of jurisdiction and authority. Um, and so we say, when we're running, it's to say to people, we need a new political arrangement in Canada. If we're really going to put the legacy of genocide behind us, we have to do it. We have to get rid of those institutions that are responsible. Crown institutions, the RCMP, the Indian Act, all of that. And you can't do that under the present system. So what really began as a whole campaign for children and to expose genocide has become a political issue for all of us. And it's, are we going to continue to pay taxes to a genocidal regime? Are you going to vote? When you vote, most people don't know that a member of Parliament Canada takes their oath of allegiance is to quote Queen Elizabeth and her descendants, period. That's a foreign monarch and a criminally convicted one, <laughs> um, not to the people of Canada or constitution. So it's really an act of treason. You're handing over your authority to a foreign power. They're not accountable to you, they're accountable to her in London under the governor general, who can remove the government at any time. It's, it's a system of, of monarchy and autocracy. So that's in a nutshell why I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing now. And it's um, gonna be fun. It's like the word reconciliation. You heard that R word now all the time, don't you, right? They used to have truth and reconciliation. They dropped the truth. Now all you see, like, yeah. in, the, in the, you notice that? Yeah. Um, in all the libraries, they have reconciliation week. In the university curriculum, reconciliation, reconciliation. They're pounding that word into your head. Reconciliation, the meaning of it originally, it came from a Latin word, the reconcilia. And I'll show you what it is. When a tribal chief would rebel against Rome, they would bring him in chains to the forum. He would kneel in front of the emperor, supplicate himself and beg forgiveness, and then ritually be strangled. That was called being reconciled to the emperor. In the, in the records of the Inquisition, you'll see a thing saying, so-and-so uh, was tried for heresy, for Lutheranism, and was reconciled to the church through loss of property. In modern times, the term reconciliation has been used as part of the neurolinguistic program and to make you think that, oh, it's two, when pe two people make up and have worked things out so it's better. No, it means resubordination. And that's exactly what's happened to natives. They, native people have been said, have been told, you can get a bit of money. In return, you've got to sign off. You've got to take this blood money and never do anything. You've got to say that nothing really bad happened to you and I let the churches and government that raped and killed your relatives and raped you and destroyed your life, we don't hold you accountable for anything. That's called being reconciled. You're resubordinated, you're kept in your place, and we're still in charge. That's what it means in practice. Not in our psyche, but change means about taking back our mind, taking back the language, knowing what they mean when they say certain words. Well, here we are once more, the University of British Columbia, where I actually grew up. I moved here when I was 12, over 50 years ago. I got three of my university degrees here, 
And if I had have been a good boy and not going into certain areas, I would have been lauded and applauded by now and not a pariah in my own culture. But the, the academic environment out here is so strange, you know, the way they can shut somebody out totally, legally, and everyone just turns a blind eye, while at the same time thinking they're nice, liberal, progressive Canadians. It's very strange. I'll give you an example. After I uncovered that evidence in Kerner Library of the 50% death rate in residential schools, and I tried to share that with people in my department, and they all turned away with a frown on their face, I found even more stuff which indicated there are actual quotes from Dr. Peter Bryce, the government medical inspector in Western Indian residential schools, who said, quote, I believe the conditions are being deliberately created to spread infectious disease. That was in 1907, 50% death rate for another 40 years. Evidence? No. <laughs> just people just didn't want to hear it. But what was interesting, the guy in the department who made sure I got scuttled, my degree got scuttled, his name was Murray Elliott, he was a United Church official, he was actually, at the very moment I was in the department, he was sitting on the church committee that was deciding whether I should retain my status as a minister or not. He helped arrange the defrocking, the kangaroo court that threw me out, and he was also deciding whether I should get academic funding for my thesis on Indian residential schools and the complicity of the United Church. <laughs> Conflict of interest? Not according to the University of British Columbia, who after he had forced me out and made sure I didn't get any funding, despite my first grade average, first time in the department that had ever happened, they said, no, he wasn't in a conflict of interest, even though he's with the church that I was criticizing. No. So anyway, it turned out all right, not from a professional point of view for me, but in terms of getting the information out, because if, instead of sitting in a dusty shelf somewhere, my PhD thesis became the basis of hidden from history, the Canadian Holocaust, and then all, a lot of my other work and research. So it got out there, it was the hidden hand work. But the way he did it was so efficient, you know, um, just slam dunk. He used to go around the department telling grad students that I had a mental problem, I had problems with my wife. This is a professor talking about a grad student. No one objected, no one thought that was a problem. It shows you how effectively it works. And even seven years later, I was still shouted, shut out at UBC. I was invited by Richard Fredericks, a sociology professor here, to come and speak on my research. I was arranged to give five lectures. This is February 2003. And after one lecture, Richard kind of sheepishly explained that I couldn't come back. And he didn't explain until about two months later what had happened. He had been spoken to by David Pocatello, the head of the sociology department, who actually knew me. I took some anthro courses from him when I was younger. We were friends at one point. Anyway, David Pocatello says to Richard, Kevin is not to be invited back. His book on residential schools is to be removed from your curriculum on crimes against humanity, and you're on suspension. He didn't give a reason why. Eventually, Richard was forced out of the department, had to go teach in Malaspina College in Nanaimo. So he got blacklisted for the crime of having me in. But it shows you how effectively it works. You know, I, I shared that anecdote about how effectively it is, so easy it is to shut out somebody in the academic world in Canada. And I circulated it to the Canadian Association of University Teachers and other academics. They just, they said, we can't believe that would happen in Canada, even though I had all the proof and evidence. So it shows you why the censorship carries on. You know, the academic world, like the media, is just completely controlled. Certain issues, you don't exist. If you advocate certain issues, you don't exist. The issue doesn't exist. Nevertheless, the per truth persists, and I'm still out here digging into all this stuff, Glad to be here, still alive after 50 years on the campus. Even though the bullshit continues, so does the opposition, so does the truth. These personal attacks, and there have been a lot of them. If you look at any internet history of me, it all, there was a group called Stop Kevin Anna. It, it's like classic uh, scare tactics. And I always say, I remember once I had, I had dinner with Noam Chomsky once and at MIT, and he was plugging my book with people and that. And, he said, you know, back in the 60s, the FBI was circulating rumors that I was having sex with my grad students and doing drugs. And I said, really? So what'd you do? He said, when the reporter asked me that, I just said, show me the evidence. Hmm. So evidence isn't hearsay. It isn't, yeah, I heard this about Kevin. Or, you know what they say about Kevin? Yeah, it's like, yeah, he's done. No, evidence is something that'll stand up in a court of law. So a document, uh, somebody who actually witnessed something, 
backed up by other people who actually witnessed it, like credible evidence, right? And nobody who's ever said these things about me has ever backed it up in any evidence. So I, and I often say to people, no one's ever sued me. Like, if this was all false, don't you think I, I would have been dragged into court years ago and with a gag order? But they will not put it into court because then they know it's true. It'll be on the public record and it'll be legitimated. So they have to just, if I was native, I'd be dead years ago. But I've got a pale skin. It protects me. So what you do in that case, you don't kill me. That creates a martyr. And you don't want a martyr. You don't want people saying, hey, he's dead. Maybe he was onto something, right? You want to create people afraid of the word Kevin Anna. And that worked for many years. And it's still in a lot of in the academic circles and that I can tell you, keep you here all night telling what happened at the University of British Columbia when I was basically shut out, my PhD shut down and then actually banned from speaking on campus. Um, still in effect. Um, but I mean, this is what you do to somebody like me. You assassinate the character, make people afraid of them. Peter Montague, who I mentioned, the RCMP guy, he, uh, the black ops specialist, he said, he was quoted once saying, take down Annette and you take down the issue. And it's true because you equate somebody so much with the issue that when you delegitimate them and get people afraid of them, they won't be listening about that anymore. Because for many years, I wasn't the only one talking about genocide and mass murder. Now the prime minister agrees with me. Good news. I admire your extraordinary bravery to say, because you could be pretty easily snuffed out and not a lot of people would be inquiring about it, right? Probably not. If you have a firm conviction about something and it's the truth, it kind of what keeps you going, but really, like what gives you, <laughs> what keeps you going? <laughs> In light of the fact that you're vilified and you're blacklisted and, you, and people say terrible things and you're constantly getting bad news about this is being shut down and that, you know, and then, well, uh, I don't know how you do it. When I was uh, 31, uh, the short answer is, I don't know either. <laughs> like, I just know I, it's the right thing to do and I'm pissed off what they've done to my family, what they did to me and my children what they stole from me for no reason other than I was talking about their dirty laundry, which they eventually had to admit themselves, right? Where the hell did they get away to doing that? And all those kids on the ground and patting themselves on the back because they, they, they said the right words now. I mean, it's partly that. But I remember, um, this is very deja vu. When I was uh, 31, I was in seminary. I went on a fact-finding tour to the Guatemalan refugee camps on the border of Guatemala, Mexico. These are people who are refugees from the Civil War there, uh, horrible stuff. And um, I was taken into the camp by a guy called Brother Fidel. He was an ex-Catholic priest who had been booted out by the bishop because he was getting too close to the Indians. Kind of like deja vu for me, right? And um, too much like Jesus, right? Kind of uh, quoting the Bible too much. But anyway, so he was living among these refugees, right? And the Guatemala arm, Guatemalan army kept raiding across the border and killing people all the time. And kids were dying every day from malnutrition, typhus, dysentery, the whole bit. Rickets, kids running around blind, you know, nightmare. But these people were the happiest, those children and those people. They had a love I'd never seen before anywhere. And when I came back to Canada, I felt it was barren. I felt like I'd come back to a dead zone because I... I didn't find people who were devoted to each other. They would die for each other. And they did all the time because they had nothing else. They didn't have the buffers. They only had each other. And I remember I said to Fidel one night, I said, uh, which means faithful, I said, uh, don't you ever get scared like what you're asking me now, right? And that was on the other side of the veil I had to go through myself, that when you go through a testing, you say, hey, I did it. I'm stronger than I realize. I'm braver than I realize. We all go through that. You know, when we've been through, we discover that warrior in ourself, right? You can't, nobody can do it for you. You've got to find it on your own. But I said to him, don't you get scared? And he said, yeah. And he said, I got in my Land Rover and drove away once. I got in my Land Rover and drove away once from the refugee camp. And then I came back and I said, so what brought you back? He said, well, whenever I get scared, I go to the... 
I go to the uh, poorest child in the camp, and I just look at her, and I realize she can't get away. And she gives me the courage to last another day. And that's my friends who died. Okay, that's Harry Wilson. These people are all killed by, he was killed by the Vancouver police, beaten. Bingo Dawson. Uh, he, these people are all part of our movement in Vancouver. They're all targeted after we started occupying churches. They're all just killed. Ricky saw that he ended up dead. William Coombs, you know this one. William was the one who saw Queen Elizabeth take those kids. Erica Kelly, the nurse who treated him, said it was arsenic poisoning. We've got that testimony from her. She's going to testify at the tribunal as well in September. All the classic symptoms of arsenic poisoning. He dies suddenly. He's about to come to London to give testimony. He's called in the Mounties. Bring him to St. Paul's Hospital, Catholic Hospital. And he's dead in 48 hours. So these, these are my brothers, sisters, right? They keep me going every day. So it's amazing, right? Because you find out you're, you're bigger than yourself, right? I mean, exactly. It's for all of them, for all of us. And we, we find that among ourselves. And I just want to, before I get to you, a, another beautiful story about William. They used to hold him at the Kamloops and Mission Catholic schools. They had him on a rack at night, like a rack. And the priest would sodomize him with a cattle prod, right? Because he was a spirit dancer. He was a spirit dancer, and they would target the traditionalists, the ones with the sacred knowledge. And the, okay, they would destroy them. That was the whole point. So they really targeted William. And um, he couldn't even go near a Catholic church. He couldn't hear the sound of a church bell. He'd start getting sick, right? So we go into Holy Rosary Cathedral one morning. There's about 50 of us. I'm the only white guy there. We show up. And normally the cops and the Knights at Columbus are surrounding the church to keep us out, right? Nobody there that morning. And the doors are standing wide open. <laughs> so I say to everybody, you know, this is a sign. We've got to go. So we walk in to the cathedral during the mass. And we've got our banner, all the children need a proper burial, right? And we stand at the front of the cathedral. And the, everyone is just gobsmacked. They don't know what to do, right? The people in the pews are kind of interested, right? And the priest is freaking out. He gets the organist to keep playing, to drown us out, right? And people are kind of wondering what's going on. And, and the priest is getting, he's turning red. He's just so hate-filled, right? And he comes over to me and he, he actually gets me in an arm lock, this priest. And he said, we're, we're asking you to leave. And I said, we've asked you where you buried the children you killed. And he goes, Hah! and he walks off. He just leaves, right? And so we're just standing there with a banner and the people are just don't know what to do. And I'm looking out and there in the pews is William. He's got these flyers and he's handing them out to people with this big smile on his face. I said, holy shit, like William. <laughs> and we, the, the, the elders start drumming, they kind of sense when the cops were coming. So we walk out and as we walk out, everybody stands up that Catholic population there, you know, they all stand up. They knew the right thing to do, right? So we get out there and everyone's so happy, right? And the, the cop comes running up, lumbering up, and he, he said, you can't go in there. I said, well, I already did. Sorry, you should get here quicker next time, right? And I said, by, by the way, read this. And I gave him a leaflet, right? But, and um, so I go over to William, man, and we're hugging, and I say, William, what gives? <laughs> like, how did you do that? And he said, uh, I, I saw you going in, and I, I didn't want to let you down. Right? And uh, I realized then, the way we all heal, we do it together. You know, you don't do, he, he went to counseling for 20 years, didn't do a thing for him. That one day, and he stopped drinking that week. It came back, it only lasted a couple of weeks, but he stopped drinking, and that's, if you knew William, what a miracle that was. But it was a miracle only as complex as the fact that we did it together. We, he said, I don't have to be afraid of those priests anymore. I went in and just see they're just people. And like the, the institutional mask falls away and we just see they're just people, right? And 
So if you t ask me how I get the courage, that's part of it. But there's an unknown part that I can't explain. And I think it's, it's finding who we really are. You know, I've had more things open up for me inside since then as a result that have answered that more for me about why I have that ability I never knew I had. But you find it and you go through my worst pain was losing my daughters. Right. That's why I got accepted in the healing circle. They saw I was suffering and bleeding. I wasn't the do-gooder coming to fix them, right? I was just their equal in our pain. But we weren't afraid to talk about the pain. And that's hard in Canada to do that, you know? Yeah, uh, oh, yeah. It all depends on this grassroots effort. One of the things that we've talked about doing is um, we're, we did this in North Winnipeg. I'm officially running in North Winnipeg because that's my home. That's where my ancestors are buried. But they were on my mom's side. They came from Scotland with Selkirk in the 1820s. They intermarried with the Cree. That's why I've got a great grandmother who's Cree, Oji Cree, Ojibwe Cree. Um, so that's home for me, right? But there's candidates in East York in uh, Picton, which is, I think, Bayo Quinte. Out in Alberta, BC, there's more people coming on board. And we want to get the message out that this is really not just about, like, there's a republic movement in England, but what they want is they want the queen out and a president in, just change the figurehead. And it's, it goes much deeper than that. Like, we want to take our country back. And that means getting people to take responsibility in their own communities. One of the things we tried in North Winnipeg, we convened a neighborhood assembly where we had to because it's really poor and the city ignores them. So we said, like, what do we need in our neighborhood? Let's talk about the kinds of changes we want to bring about. Um, one of the things that people have talked about doing is under common law, you have an obligation if there is a crime going on and the courts aren't doing anything about it to take. That's why we were able to convene those common law courts. We've convened common law courts in a lot of diff different issues. Citizen arrest laws in Canada have been broadened. So before you had to have seen a crime to detain somebody. Now all you have to do is suspect this person might be going to harm somebody. Well, that's one of the answers in terms of people say, what do we do about child trafficking and child abuse? We need to protect the children of our communities. And activating people at the grassroots. Um, one of the things in, uh, I think it's Goderich, that's in the Southern Ontario, uh, the city council and mayor there, one of our people out there in Sarnia went up and shared some of the stuff and they said, you know, most of the money we pay to the feds don't go to essential services. It, the, the federal tax money goes to pay off debts to foreign banks. And one of the reasons there's a big debt is because the super wealthy and the corporations and the banks haven't paid taxes in 20 years, right? So close those loopholes, you'd have $20 billion and whatever, but the feds aren't going to do that because it's the crown system, governor general, privy council, it's the old boys network. 80% of the laws passed in Canada are never even debated in parliament. They're order in council. Past order in council, when you see PC in front of a law, it means privy council. So it's not even representative government. It's not even responsible government. And we had our attempted revolution in 1837. It got defeated. Are 1776. My great 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 grandfather Philip took part uh, in it. Philip Annett, he was a farmer down in Watford. Um, and we need that system in place, but it's got to be we who create it. So um, that's the, the message to really for people to take responsibility, think of what, how you can start that process in your own community. And we have, we publish books on this. I have copies here. Uh, but sign the list and we'll be in touch and there'll be more specific ways you can help. Uh, one thing you could do is just listen to our radio show. It's every Sunday uh, at 6 Eastern time. It's bbsradio.com and then slash here we stand. One word, bbsradio.com slash here we stand. That's the name of the program. We've got people involved in all these campaigns coming on all the time. And it's a good way to stay on top of that. But I'll put the sheet out and you can sign it. Thank you. In 1649, there was a revolution in England. The king was overthrown. He was tried in a lawful court set up by parliament, uh, tried for crimes against his own people, waging a war against his own people. And he was 
lawfully convicted and executed. There were two laws brought in by Parliament that said to advocate the reestablishment of the monarchy as an act of treason, to reestablish it will be null and void because we the people in Congress, like what the Americans said in 1776, we the people constitute ourselves as the authority. We're born, it's, it's the enlightenment idea that we are self-governing people because we're born naturally sovereign. Inherent, we hold these truths to be self-evident because it's obvious. You, you're not, two notions of law, the Roman system that said, you have the rights given to you by a ruler and they can take you away at any time because you're property. That's what the capital letters are in your driver license. Capitus maxima diminutia. The maximum diminishing of head, it means you're a slave. That's what the capital thing means. But you can step out of that because that's a corporation made without your knowledge or consent when you were born and your parents registered you at birth, right? You'd step out of it. And um, so anyway, that system of Roman law says, you know, we tell you what your rights are. Like the Charter of Rights and Freedom says that. You have the following rights, but it's an act of parliament so we can take them away at any time. And uh, they stick in all these notwithstanding, you know, acts of nature, health emergencies, you know, all this bullshit, right? But anyway, um, the other system of law, natural law, says, no, you're not given rights. They only exist when you practice them, and nobody can stop you from practicing. That's why in the U.S. Constitution it says, Congress shall enact no law that violates these fundamental liberties. It doesn't matter what they pass, what statutes, what homeland security... Hello, you don't take away my inherent sovereignty, but it only exists when I practice it. So that's a long way of saying that um, it's fiction. But we create an alternative reality when we say, and like in these neighborhood assemblies, we did this in Dublin. They set up a common law assembly in Dublin. Twelve or more people signed it. We're a legislative body now. We're going to pass laws in our community and force them with their own common law sheriffs. That's how government of the people, by the people, for the people works. It doesn't matter how small it is, it's a seed out of which it all grows. So that's grassroots democracy, right? Three stars represent French, English, indigenous founding nations. Um, these borders represent what's called the Tura Wampum. And the Tura Wampum is a treaty that the, the uh, I believe it was the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations, that'd be who we call the Iroquois, and then the Mohawk. They signed this treaty with the English and the French. And the, 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 I was given the, the flag, the Tuarompa flag by the Mohawk when I went to do the dig in Brantford. They said, go tell the story among your people because you don't, you, you've never been taught this. But the Tuarompa treaty said that we, and the, the European powers signed this initially, they said that we are to go down the river. This represents two streams of the river. We're to go down in each other's, in our own boats, not seeking to dominate the other. You're in your ship, we're in our canoes. We share the land that way. It's the basis of equality, like they were in the, around the council fires in the longhouse. You know, nobody was over anyone else. They all had equal voice. And that was a model of democracy that they used in the Federalist Papers in America because there was no European model for democracy. It was all always about kings, right? But the, they embodied that. They said, we're to get back to this. Um, and that's the, our vision of Canada, that you know, this legacy of genocide has to be uprooted in, in here and in, in the way we live with each other. So I, I say to people, if you take all the wealth, and Wikipedia reported this, if you took all the wealth produced every year in Canada and divided it equally among all of us, we'd each have an income of $248,000. So tell me why not only is there poverty, but any <laughs> problem with anything materially. It's like, where's it all going? I mean, Hello, I'm Kevin Annie, Eagle Strong Voice. It's July 31st, 2019. Today I have an important letter to read to all of you. It's an open letter I issued today to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of Canada. It reads as follows. Dear Mr. Trudeau, I am today issuing you a challenge to join me in a public debate on the question 
how must Canada and its churches be prosecuted and punished for their proven crime of genocide? I propose that this debate between us take place in the city of Vancouver at a public venue of our mutual agreement on Monday, September 9th of this year. This invitation to you is issued well before the impending federal election to allow you the time to schedule your participation in this most important debate. As you are aware, on June 7th, you were issued a public summons to appear before the International Tribunal for the Disappeared of Canada, the ITDC to commence on Monday, September 16th in Vancouver. Neither you nor any of your colleagues have responded to the ITDC summons, nor have you complied with the request of those tribunal officials to meet with them to discuss your alleged complicity in crimes against humanity and your need to comply with the requirements of international law. The June summons has charged you with aiding and abetting genocide with complicity in the ongoing cover-up of the harming, trafficking, exploiting, torturing, and killing of Indigenous men, women, and children, with the violent occupying and exploiting of Native lands and resources, and with your involvement in the act of defrauding of the Canadian people and the obstruction of justice. Furthermore, on July 9th, and citing international law, the ITDC officials issued you a statement ordering you to cease and desist from any further actions that aid and abet the continued genocide of Aboriginal people. Actions like colluding in the destruction of evidence and mass grave sites of Native people, silencing witnesses, granting tax exemptions to genocidal Canadian churches, and even your act of standing as a candidate in the upcoming Canadian federal election. Now, both of these letters to you and the summons itself is posted at murderbydecree.com under ITCCS updates, but of course you've received all of these, so you know very well of what I'm talking about. Now, Mr. Trudeau, the law and the Canadian people require that you answer these charges, not only in the legally established tribunal of September 16th, but also in free and open public debate. And if you don't do that, you will appear to be evading justice, including in criminality. It's therefore incumbent on you to appear both in both of these forums, especially during the time right now when you'll be asking for a mandate from the electorate to continue in public office. I look forward to your reply, to engaging with you in public debate on this matter, and to your appearance before our lawful tribunal on September 16th. I am Kevin Annett, an advisor to the tribunal, and I also am writing to you as a candidate in the upcoming federal election under the banner of the Republican Party of Canada. I'll be running in Winnipeg North and across the country. Now, to all the rest of you, that was my letter to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. It was sent to him today, July 31st. We have proof of the delivery of that letter. Must also remind you that the tribunal, the ITDC, is responding to the fact that on June 4th, Trudeau himself publicly admitted that genocide has occurred in Canada. And so under the International Convention on the Crime of Genocide, under the Transnational Criminal Organization Convention and the statutes of the International Criminal Court. The international community and the signatory of those conventions, all of the member states, are now obligated to prosecute and punish Canada for the crime of genocide, for the admitted and proven crime of genocide. That is also incumbent on the citizens of Canada to act to prosecute their own government, lest they be accessories to a crime. Now, to follow all of this information, go to murderbydecree.com under ITCC updates. Look through the postings over the last two months. To contact the tribunal, write to disappearedofcanada at gmail.com. The Republican Party of Canada, which is sponsoring the tribunal and will provide security and international observers at that event, that party can be contacted at republicofcanada at gmail.com. And I can be written personally at thecommonland at gmail.com. Also, Listen to our weekly radio broadcasts, Here We Stand, every Sunday, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, at bbsradio.com slash Here We Stand. This is Kevin Annett, Eagle Strong Voice. I thank you. Stand by for more updates and for the response or lack of it from Prime Minister Trudeau to this invitation. Hello, everyone. This is Kevin Annett, Eagle Strong Voice. It's Tuesday, July 23rd, 2019. 
This morning I'm officially declaring myself to be a candidate in the upcoming Canadian federal election, running within the constituency of Winnipeg North. I'm doing so as a representative of the Republican Party of Canada, and I'll actively campaign under the banner and the program of that party. It is time for Canada to come of age. For too long we have labored under the burden of foreign control and indebtedness and of the murderous legacy of colonialism and genocide. Four million of our people and over one million children languish in an intergenerational poverty while the vast wealth of our nation is sucked away by foreign multinationals and their subservient agents in Ottawa. And yet as long experience has proven there is no remedy for this suffering within the present political system in Canada. For the federal government and its courts are an unaccountable clique owing their allegiance to a foreign power called the Crown of England and to its corporate partners in crime. There can be no remedy or future for our nation as long as we are denied a truly representative democracy, a sovereign republic in which the people can govern themselves and reclaim the vast wealth of our nation for all of the people. Our Republican government will do so by enacting a constitutional provision that prohibits foreign or domestic multinational corporations any control of the Canadian economy and by establishing a guaranteed national income for all Canadians. I'm running on a campaign to begin that process of securing sovereignty, prosperity and independence for the peoples of Canada. We do not recognize the authority or the legitimacy of the Crown of England and its corrupt puppet government in Ottawa. Our aim is to establish a new constitutional authority in Canada under the jurisdiction of a democratic republic. If elected, I will refuse to take the oath of allegiance to Queen Elizabeth and her descendants, and I will move for an immediate national referendum to establish a fully sovereign republic in our country. I call upon every elected member of parliament to take a similar stand and refuse the oath to the British Crown. Our Republican Party of Canada is the tip of a spear held in the hands of all of the people because a majority of Canadians, 58%, recently voted in a poll in favour of the establishment of a republic in our land. Only such a republic can wipe away the bloodstain of genocide and colonialism in Canada and unite Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in a federation of equal nations. Only such a republic can bring about a genuine equality and partnership between French and English Canada. That indeed was the dream of our ancestors, our rebel ancestors who in 1837 and 1885 fought unsuccessfully to overthrow the British crown and create a true democracy in Canada. Those ancestors have passed on to us the torch of our common dream. Those ancestors and every victim of genocide and empire look to us now today to complete and to achieve that vision, a vision symbolized in this flag of our new republic, which depicts the three founding nations, the English, the French, and the indigenous, and the original two row wampum treaty of equality by which the land was to be shared by all of us. Our new society will be the creation of all of the people, not the creation of a handful of professional politicians, but of we the people gathered in sovereign assemblies in our own neighborhoods. The Republic of Canada will be a grassroots democracy based upon the right of the people to debate and pass and enforce laws of their own choosing in their own communities. We are beginning that revolution today in many towns and hamlets across our nation. The upcoming election campaign will be a platform from which we can espouse and share that vision with all Canadians but our movement will continue long after the election. It will continue every day if it's not dependent on the outcome of that election. Our purpose is nothing less than the establishment of a new republic in Canada while we disestablish the old regime called the Dominion of Canada. Now we've commenced that movement already by calling upon all of the legal agents of the Crown of England and Canada to stand down from their oath of allegiance to Queen Elizabeth and her regime. That includes the RCMP, the police, civil servants, judges, the military, and every officer of the state. We call upon those men and women to recognize that the Crown of England, like the Vatican, is a criminally convicted genocidal regime that, under international law, has lost its right to govern. For the sake of the law itself, 
for morality and for justice. The legal agents of Canada and the Crown must now take an oath to the new republic and to its constitution that will be established by we the people at our first constitutional congress. In this way, like in any genuine revolution, we are creating our new republic alongside the old collapsing regime, armed with our own common law courts, our own citizen militias and sheriffs, and local people's assemblies. Well, some may call this treason. In fact, it is the present regime in Canada that is treasonous to the people by serving a criminal overseas regime guilty of centuries of mass murder, fraud, genocide, and theft perpetrated on all of us. Our Republican movement represents a return to the rule of law, to true democracy, and to the will of the majority of Canadians. I ask for the help and the participation of all people in Canada in this sacred historic movement. I especially appeal to the people of North Winnipeg to join me in making the first public declaration for liberty in Canada. For I grew up on Winnipeg streets and I know firsthand the crushing effects of intergenerational poverty and genocide. Generations of my Scottish ancestors lie buried in Kildonan Cemetery in the North End. And some of them and my Métis relatives fought alongside Louis Riel in 1885. So I'm returning to the land of my people to help plant another seed of our new nation. And in that spirit, let me close with the words of another one of my ancestors, Philip Annett, who fought alongside William Lyon Mackenzie and others in the ranks of the Republican movement in Upper Canada in 1837. A farmer, a blacksmith, a staunch Baptist who refused to support the Church of England with his taxes, Philip Annett summed up the vision and the promise of our true Canada when he wrote these words to his aunt, his people, his family back in Wiltshire, England, soon after he began to take up arms against the British Crown. And Philip wrote, You must all come to Canada whilst you have a chance. Here is an excellent land that can bear any crop. Here you have no rent to pay, no poor rates, and scarcely any taxes. No gamekeepers or lords over you. Here you can have every good thing. Here is a land of liberty and plenty where we are held in respect by our neighbors and we aim to keep it so. Let us continue the dream of Philip Annett and so many others. Let us take back our nation and reclaim it for all of us and for our future. This is Kevin Annett, Eagle Strong Voice, republicofkanata at gmail.com, murderbydecree.com. Stand by for more. I thank you.